Hello. Welcome to Converging Dialogues. This is Xavier Bonilla. On this episode, I am talking with Jack Ashby. Jack is the Assistant Director of the University Museum of Zoology at the University of Cambridge. Uh, he has also been the trustee of the Natural Sciences Collection Association, Honorary Research Fellow in University College London Science and Technology Studies, and sits on the Council of the Society for History of Natural History. His background and degrees are in zoology, and he is the author of the latest book, Platypus Matters, The Extraordinary Story of Australian Mammals. And that's the book we talk about in this conversation. As I say in the conversation, this was one of my favorite books I've read um, this year. It's absolutely masterful. Um, there's a lot many folks don't know about Australian mammals. And I mean, if there's one book you're going to read on this, it's going to be this book. Um, it's comprehensive, it's accessible. Um, and, you know, I just was learning something in every chapter. I mean, it was absolutely wonderful. We start the conversation by talking about monotremes, marsupials, and placentals, um, how that differentiation is made. Uh, these are the three types of mammals, where they're located around the world, and how they've spread around the world. We talk about the ways in which the rest of the world d talks about Australian mammals. Um, he talks about this a lot in his book, and I think it's a particularly instructive point. Um, many times people talk about Australian uh, mammals as weird or odd or eccentric, and um, they certainly are different, I think, from most people, many times because there are, uh, we don't see a lot of those animals, you know, like we do, you know, lions or tigers or elephants or things like that, other more common um, uh, animals. But, you know, he, he really makes a stand on saying how that's, you know, not helpful and um, not always respectful and trying to see how are they, you know, different or how are they extraordinary, as he claims, and, and how they're pretty awesome. So it's a, I think it's a really important point and it's something that is laced throughout the book, which I, which I think is really essential. We talk about the features of the platypus. Um, so it's a really incredible uh, animal. We talk about the mating and reproduction of the platypus. We talk about the echidna and their four-headed penis for the males, which was, I mean, startling to, to read in the book. I wasn't expecting that. And, oh my goodness. And then it was deeply fascinating. Um, and we talk about that. We talk about marsupials, uh, including some that have two to three uh, uh, vaginas, which is also very fascinating. Um, it's something that, you know, I, I say it in the conversation, we, we anthropomorphize everything. So we're always, you know, we're the, we're the, the, the first kind of thing where we comparing ourselves to like, well, we have this, or we have one of these, and then we compare ourselves to other animals. And really it's just taking the animals for, you know, what's normal for them and trying to understand it. So there are some very, um, different features, though, for different animals. We talk about some of the reproductive features of Tasmanian devils. We talk about opossums and the distinction between possums and opossums. Um, we talk about extinct Australian animals and the thylacine, and we talk about some of the more recent developments with trying to you know, sort of genetically resurrect the thylacine, some of the, the ethics and the probability of doing that. We talk about uh, scientists working with indigenous groups in Australia and the importance of that, impact of climate change on Australian mammals, and how to best uh, interact and understand animals in Australia. Again, I, this was such a, a, a marvelous book. Um, it's one of those books where I was, I was excited to read it and didn't have really any expectations and just kind of blew them all away. Um, even if you're not, you know, terribly interested in, you know, popular science books on animals. Um, I think it's a really good read and there's a lot of really cool history in there. And so it's, there's a lot to learn about many of these animals. And, um, you know, Jack has got a huge passion for um, Australian mammals. Um, he's absolutely brilliant and he's an absolutely wonderful human being. And uh, now I bring Jack Ashby. I am here with Jack Ashby. Jack, thanks so much for coming on the podcast. I'm uh, very excited to talk to you. Thanks for having me. I'm excited to be here. Yes, yes. You have 
truly written a, a marvelous book. It is called Platypus Matters, the Extraordinary, Extraordinary Story of Australian Mammals. Um, it's, it is really, when it comes to popular science books, uh, it is spectacular. So I, I really, I've recommended it to people. Um, I've posted about it. I can't recommend it uh, highly enough. So this is, this is a true gem. Thank you. That's very kind of David. Yes, yes. And so I'm very excited to talk all about it. Um, for for most people, um, I have uh, listeners around the world. Um, and so I have a handful of folks that do live in Australia. Um, so they'll be very happy with this episode. Uh, um, but for most people in um, North America and in maybe Western Europe might not know as much about many of the animals we'll discuss. So I'm, I'm very, very happy to talk about them and, and how uh, wonderful they are. Uh, just tell listeners, for those that don't know you, um, who you are, what your background is, what you do, uh, any positions you hold, and um, how you're able to write the book. Sure. So um, I'm the Assistant Director of the University Museum of Zoology in Cambridge, which is one of the UK's oldest and um, we like to say biggest and most significant uh, natural history museums. We have about two million specimens covering mm. the whole of the animal kingdom, all of biological time, all of the world. Um, was put together by some of the kind of biggest names in the history of science. Um, and my job there is to uh, look after the, the team who manage the collections and look after the team who kind of uh, organize the visitor, the visitor experience. So what do people see and how do they enjoy the museum? Um, on top of that, I have a research fellowship at the moment studying the, the colonial histories of the Australian mammal collections in our museum. So who really collected them? What are the mm. stories of how they got to Cambridge? Um, and what, you know, what networks are involved in, and often what are the troubling histories with collecting natural history museums. Mm. And your background is in zoology, yeah? Yeah, that's right. Um, yeah, so this is a zoologist and, and Australian mammals is, is very much my corner of zoology, which is how I came to write this book. Um, it's, I, I kind of noticed that the rest of the world was very, very fond of Australian mammals. I think Australian mammals get a kind of great deal in the public affection, mm -hmm. but the the world doesn't generally seem to think that they are the best animals that have ever evolved, which is my contention. And so <laughs> I think it's trying, to, the, 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 some, it's trying to set right some, some popular myths, which I'm sure we'll talk about. about <laughs> yes, animals. yes, yes. There is a little bit of a, I don't want to say a fetishizing, but there is a little bit of, for people that haven't been in Australia or haven't lived there or things like that, there's a little bit of like a... Um, I don't know, a type of voyeurism of sorts, right? Of like, oh, look at this, you know, you know, exotic animal or something like that. And, and well, well, obviously there's, I think what makes Australian animals unique is that, you know, many of them only live on that continent. They don't live in other parts of the world. So I think that's, that's something that makes it novel of sorts. But uh, I do think one of the great things about your book is that you definitely give them their due and give them the respect and show um, how pretty, uh, wonderful they are. So, um, I, to, to that end, um, maybe we can first start by talking about, about Australia and what makes it, um, you know, position in a certain way to have all types of mammals. And maybe you can go over those. So you have the monotremes, the marsupials and the placentals. So what's the kind of overview here? How did we, how did Australia get all of them? Um, although some more than others. And, uh, what's the, what's the story there? That's a good question. I'm, I'm not sure we know the answer exactly to that, but I should, I guess I'll, I'll tell you what I, what I think um, mm -hmm. and perhaps explain what those three groups are. So yeah, as you said, there are, there are, there are three groups of mammals that, that are separated by the, how they reproduce. And the very smallest of them is the monotremes, which is just platypuses and echidnas. So echidnas are kind of spiny, uh, long snouted anteating relatives of platypuses and platypuses and echidnas um are famous for laying eggs mm -hmm. so they're the egg laying mammals um which i think makes them pretty uh extraordinary mm -hmm. um and then the other two groups of mammals are the really really uh familiar placental mammals so that's the, by far the largest group so of about there are about six and a half thousand species of mammal in total um and about six thousand two hundred of them or six thousand two hundred and or 300 perhaps even, are placental mammals. Mm -hmm. um, and they're the mammals that give birth after a, a relatively long pregnancy and then finish off their, their infant growth by suckling milk on a teat. So we are placental mammals. So are rodents and dogs and 
whales and cows and most most mammals uh, as i say and the third group is the marsupials marsupials do the opposite to placentals they give birth after a really short pregnancy and then do most of their infant growth by suckling milk um on a teat but often in a pouch and that's mm. what marsupials i guess are famous for so how did australia get them all um well uh the monotremes evolved in australia uh we think um or at least the at least the, the platypuses evolved in australia but but when australia was actually at the south pole um and connected to other parts of the world but uh, in australia that's how it, yeah, they've been they've kind of always been there i guess mm-hmm. uh marsupials came down from um it's really interesting they came down they either evolved in asia or north america um and then got down into south america uh, previously when North America and uh, and South America were, were connected the last time that they were geologically connected and then at, at that time and uh, Antarctica was connected to South America so they could go around from South America through Antarctica and into Australia so that's how the marsupials got there and then the placental mammals island hopped we think from Southeast Asia mm. um when uh, the sea level was lower floating on um floating on kind of plant rafts or they flew the bats uh, uh-huh. flew. Uh-huh. <laughs> that's, that's how they all got there but uh, did you ask why why they were only found there um i'm not sure we know the answer <laughs> sure right well, well marsupials aren't only found there but right um, right that was the, that was I, my next question there was we we know that there's the monotremes are only on australia correct they also found in new guinea which is new guinea okay um, so it's closer. not very far yeah yeah, yeah just, just to the north and connected but, to and obviously yeah. placentals are everywhere um or in most most parts of the world but uh, marsupials are are not just in uh, the oceanic region they're also in uh, latin america as well correct yeah in 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 all of the americas actually uh, all, all the way you know almost of the way up north america you have opossums so the virginia opossum mm-hmm. um is a, a well-known north american marsupial but there's about 100 species yes. in south and central america um so that that's a, they make up a pretty significant part of the the fauna of south america for this for that reason that they, mm-hmm. they crossed um and then the opossums actually crossed back when um crossed back into north america a few million years ago when when north america reconnected i i definitely want to talk to you about the the possums because um i i, I live over here not far from virginia and so um i was I, I just never knew, this is my ignorance, I never knew that they were marsupials. <laughs> I never really thought about possums to begin with. And so I was, I literally was reading it one night and I had my mind blown of like, wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute. And it, so it was, it was really fascinating for me uh, to, to realize that. So we'll come to that later. I guess the, the question I have is, is something you talk about all throughout the book in different chapters and in different ways and certain things about histories is about the language about how animals in australia are discussed some people have thought of them as weird or exotic or um, foreign or um you know certain things like that where again like i said in the beginning this almost this kind of uh, voyeuristic thing or or this kind of you know almost very different or odd or things like that and why do you think that is that we've done that is that just a pure ignorance thing in some ways or many people don't interact with a lot of these animals or um you know is it is it something else right is there something else where you know people there's a, a deeper history there what is the i guess the kind of genesis of these ways of talking about uh animals on that continent so this is something i talk about a lot in the book of, of how the world comes to understand australian mammals how the wider world comes to australia to understand them and, and as you say like pretty much any time i talk to someone about platypuses which is a lot um <laughs> i'll tell them the amazing things that they do and the and the response is almost universally that's so strange uh-huh. um, whereas if i were to tell someone a story about what bears do or what ants do or what deer do um that, that are equally incredible um people's response would be oh my goodness that's amazing mm-hmm. uh there's something socially ingrained in us to immediately pivot to strange uh, mm-hmm. when it comes to australian mammals and indeed if you look at literally any newspaper article uh, that is written about today um you know mm-hmm. that is written about particularly platypuses and echidnas but marsupials too it will go to you know nature's strangest creation or you know the world's mm-hmm. weirdest mammal mm-hmm. um and you know the whole weird and wonderful trope is is right through kind of every uh natural history documentary 
every museum exhibit kind of pivots to this mm. you know weird and wonderful exoticizing and it's meant to be celebratory but the kind of the interesting thing that i've found is if that well at least my theory is that it it comes from a really long history of of, of viewing australia as other as of, of of a really deep set colonial mindset that uh what is different is inferior mm-hmm. so you know the british invaded australia in 1788 and they found animals that they'd never seen before and it is perfectly i'm very different to what they've seen before um it's perfectly kind of natural to see different as alien that's that's how that that mind works but but every one of those colonial descriptions and even in even into the 20th century um it it very clearly is the the, the naturalist's writing are very clearly saying okay here is a kangaroo or a koala or a wombat or, or any species and and inherent in their descriptions are it is it is biologically inferior and mm. evolutionary in the inferior when we mm. when, when the time comes for evolution to be at the fore um to placental mammals or mammals that they're more familiar with in europe and that's mm. got to really it doesn't take a great leap of mental acuity to, to see that that really ties into how the whole of australia was viewed mm. by um europe as as inferior and it it's it's quite I think it's quite challenging when you think, oh, we've been conditioned to appreciate Australian mammals. As I said, everyone is fond of them. But if we're being kind of socially conditioned to think of them as odd, um, I think it's interesting to unpick where that comes from. Yeah, no, I absolutely agree. I think that it's obviously there are some things that are different about them from other animals or things that are interesting or things that are, you know, extraordinary or, but I think to say that they're, you know, weird or odd, or, you know, it it does feel like it has a type of foreign kind of concept to it. And, you know, I think maybe some people don't mean anything by it, but I do think there might be some implicit things that people have just become a kind of adapted to saying like, oh, this is, you know, a kind of othering of sorts. And so, you know, I think that maybe initially in 1788 or whatever, that maybe could have been the case, but now we've had... (laughs) you know, 200 years plus, um, we know a few things, we've done good science to know that there are many things that make them um, pretty marvelous creatures, no more, no less than any other creatures on the planet. So I think that that's, that comes through through your book loud and clear. And I think that that's a, a really, it's a nice, important um, uh, message that, that comes through in the book. So the book's called Platypus Matters. Uh, I'm assuming that all the other anim- animals matter as well, but uh, mm-hmm. <laughs> the platypus is pretty awesome. Uh, describe the platypus and what makes them distinct at the very least. I mean, there's, I mean, I can list these off for you. You can just spell it, spit it off for us, but <laughs> they have their two sensory systems, the, how their b- bills function, no ears, no teeth, but pads. There's only a single species, as far as we know, of platypus, their hands and their feet, how they work underwater. The the mating aspects of the platypus is, is incredible. Um, the venom in the male's foot, all these different things. So just kind of walk us through the kind of uh, demographic uh, uh, face sheet, if you will, for the platypus sure. of how they, of how, how, they, how they are and what their features are. So that question is, tell me everything you know. Tell about me pl- everything you know about platypus. <laughs> I like it. <laughs> yeah, platypus is the, the, the cover star, but, but for no greater reason than they're my favorite animal. Well, there is a greater reason. They're, they're my favorite animal because they do amazing things, but also I think they're the the, the species that is most um, affected by this this bias and when we talk about it, because perhaps they are the most different. Um, so they they do some genuinely amazing things, uh, kind of evolutionary up to adaptations that are almost unique among mammals. So um, they are one of the only mammals that can detect electricity, uh, which they do with their bills. Mm. So as as we're all taught in in school every muscular contraction in the uh in the in an animal's body is controlled by electrical impulses sent around nerves um and platypuses underwater can sense those electrical impulses given off by their prey through their bills so they can even even when a crayfish or a worm or um insect larvae are kind of lying still in the silt at the bottom of a lake or a river they can sense 
they can kind of I, I'm air quoting see the world <laughs> in electrical impulses and um, given off by their heartbeats even it's it's in, it's genuinely incredible um they can also you know sense touch with their with their um with their bills really really hypersensitive touch so they they are amazing hunters underwater and it, it really mystified um naturalists for a long time um to work out how they could eat as much food as they eat which is it is a lot of food like you know mm. almost their entire body weight in 24 hours mm. uh, and they're catching this food with their eyes and their ears closed underwater and no one worked out how it was doing it but it turns out it was electrical reception which was only um detected in the 80s and, and confirmed in the 90, not eight, nine, 1980s and 1990s that platypuses could do this and um, so that's that's kind of the headline of almost nothing does that when i say almost nothing it's it's well, echidnas also uh, yeah. are electroreceptive uh -huh. because they evolved from platypuses um and as far as we know one species of dolphin the guyana dolphin uh -huh. can also detect electricity it, how is this different from eels uh, it's eels? very similar to okay. eels, uh -huh. um, but what well, different eels do different things, but um, they can't. So electric eels can send out electrical impulses. Platypuses cannot shock you. Um, but they do have other <laughs> ways of surprising people. <laughs> um, uh, but some low, low, uh, low tense, low voltage electric uh, fish can kind of put out. They put out a um, electrical impulse, but then they sense its conductivity on the objects around them um, but, but sharks for example can detect the electrical impulses mm. um given off by uh by prey so it's it's similar there um uh you mentioned they have no ears um they have they have ears but they don't have external ears so they don't have a, a pinna as we call it the floppy bit that's made of <laughs> cartilage um we think that 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 the pinna the floppy external ear evolved after monotremes platypuses and echidnas ancestors split off from the rest of mammals but um but they do do something interesting with their ears they're the only animals that are known to pair their ears with their eyes uh in a little furrow so on the sides of their heads there's this muscular groove and inside that groove sits their eyes and sits their ears and when they dive underwater they, they squeeze up this they, they tense this this groove and it's sealed shut so they protect their eyes and their ears um, from the water, but it it's it also works as an external ear because they can cock the furrow. They can mm. they can kind of point this groove with the muscles to a source of sound above um, above water. They're really sensitive, but really sensitive hearing. Wow. Um, and yeah, you also mentioned they have no teeth. Mm -hmm. This is what like. Platypuses have, have cracked teeth, have, have, not literally, but they have, they have solved the problem with teeth. Like, <laughs> teeth are terrible. Uh, how many problems yes, have yes, most yes. humans experienced <laughs> in their life with teeth? M many like, dentists around the world make a fortune because of how horrible our teeth are, and whether, whether we exactly. do it, whether we do it, or some of it is just our, our, our genetics or whatever, but yeah, teeth are, are helpful in some ways, but they cause a lot of problems. <laughs> exactly, and platypuses, have lost their teeth in their relatively recent evolutionary history mm -hmm. um what they've done they part of this, as i mentioned they eat a lot of hard food like crustaceans so crayfish a uh, chewy and also they're foraging in in silt so mm -hmm. they're grabbing mouthfuls of of sand and grit um and then if they were to chew those with their teeth any animal that eats food like that ends up wearing its teeth down and mm -hmm. dying of starvation if it lives long enough mm -hmm. um what platypuses do is they've got rid of those teeth and they've replaced them with with really strong horny ridges uh inside their bills and so they're made of keratin which is what makes you know fingernails and hairs and and mm. cow horns um the thing about keratin is that you can grow it constantly from your skin mm -hmm. so they're chewing up this food and as it wears down they're just replacing it from the bottom growing up so they've they've done wonders with evolution of that evolutionary genius of <laughs> of um cartilage mouth um you also have hands yeah they they i like to call them swiss army knives or transformers <laughs> uh, their hands they they do different jobs uh, depending on where they are they can flip out different tools so platypuses are you know they're they're aquatic swimming mammals um but they also can burrow and they also spend time on land uh and their their hands adapt so in the water they've have got um these long or oh, uh, big uh webs that they can unfold and they're 
their webs actually go under their fingers and they've got these long claws which act like struts mm -hmm. um so the, the the claws support the web but they're not attached to it um so they can swim and obviously that's a good paddle uh then when they walk on land they just ball up their claws and they ball up their um, webbing and they walk on their knuckles um but then when they're digging and the female platypus can dig maybe 30 meters but um more usually 10. And that, wow. you know the animal's only 60 centimeters two feet long mm -hmm. um so that's that's quite impressive and they they do that by folding back the, the webbing and popping out their claws and then they've got massive muscles uh on their forelimbs and they can they can dig like that <laughs> um, what else did you ask? Well, I asked also about the the mating. The mating is 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 is, is quite the is, is quite the marvel. So, just discuss how the platypuses they mate, how they have the the shell that grows to the egg, the young mm -hmm. drink the milk. This is this is one part I was reading the book, and I was like, that's that's incredible, right? They drink the young drink the milk through mammary glands in the fur, right? So there's no external yeah. kind of like with, you know, placentals or whatever. like there's, it's just through the fur and it, yeah, it's, I mean, it's, 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 it's spectacular. And I was like, wow, how I've never heard of that. And so, and then also about the venom in the, and the male only, I think foot. So just mm -hmm. those two, those two bit, bits. Cool. Yeah. So platypus, as I said, mentioned, they, they produce eggs rather than live birth. Um, and, and many people, maybe I should explain that many people think yeah. that giving birth to live young is a defining feature of mammals and it was until platypuses were, and echidnas were discovered and actually it, it took about 100 years to to prove there's a long colonial science story in in, in that which, um maybe we, we can go into or maybe not but yeah platypuses lay eggs and, and laying eggs is not a defining feature of mammals but what is a defining feature of mammals is producing milk um all mammals um raise their young on milk um so I guess to address the milk side first, they don't have nipples. Uh, and that's interesting for a number of reasons, but how they suck or how they feed their young is is they just sort of like sweat out the milk mm. onto their skin. Um, mm. So platypuses outside of the breeding season have really small mammary glands. Um, you know, they, they are barely detectable. And that's the reason why it took a very long time to prove that platypuses um, produce milk because people kept catching them at the wrong time of year <laughs> um, and they didn't have nipples. So mm -hmm. people had never seen a mammal with no nipples before. Mm -hmm. um, but when during the breeding season, I went through when they're lactating, um, the, the mammary glands expand to you know, cover their entire bellies and even like up onto their backs. Um, mm -hmm. So they are uh, covered in these um, milk glands and they sweat it out and the babies just uh, just um, suck it up or lick it up from the fur. And that's interesting evolutionarily because if you think about it, um, a platypus's bill couldn't have evolved if they had to attach to a teat, mm. I think, um, mm -hmm. most probably. But, you know, to, in order to in order to suck or in order to you know even suck a straw if you try if you try to suck a straw whilst um without forming a seal around the straw um and also sitting a, forming a second seal at the back of your throat it's why you can't breathe and suck at the same time mm -hmm. um, so platypuses can't do that because they can't form a seal around the bill um so that would never evolve neither with the echidnas um but it's also interesting because without a nipple the uh, milk um, it gets exposed to the outside world. So nipples are, are, are a sterile delivery device for milk. It goes straight from inside the mother to inside the baby without ever getting contaminated by the outside world, which means that platypuses have to have really strong antibacterial um, properties in their milk mm. to stop their babies getting infected. Um, so platypus milk is being looked at for potential um, cures for hospital superbugs that have involved um, antibacterial uh, uh, antibiotic resistance. Um, so that was interesting. Um, and then the, yeah, how their eggs grow. So they, as I, as I mentioned, it took about 90 years for the, for the Western world to be satisfied that platypuses do in fact lay eggs, but how they do it is, is quite, um, I knew it was, it's unique. In fact, um, no other vertebrates produce eggs like, like platypuses do. And the reason is, or the difference is that when they're fertilized, they're just about four millimeters uh, big, um, quarter of an inch. Uh, and then at that stage, the shell is added to them uh, when they're tiny. Mm. And nothing else does this. So it's, a, it's kind of a horny, well, it's a, it's a protein um, shell, but it is solid. Uh, but it grows with the egg. So the egg ends up being about 17 millimeters. Um, so, you know, three quarters of an inch or so. Um, and um, 
it, it, yeah, it, it, the shell grows with the egg, which means that the nutrients have to be passed across from the mother to grow the egg, have to be passed across the shell wall, um, which is, uh, which is, as I say, unique. So uh, reptiles and birds, um, pro you know, produce the, the full sized egg and then add the calcium carbonate or the protein shell mm -hmm. right at the last minute, um, just before it's, um, late. So platypus is it, yeah, and the kidneys do something very different. So, I guess the question is more of an evolutionary history question here is how does, and there are many animals that have many unique features to them. You know, you could say that you could really pick an animal and, and, and say like, Oh, this is something that we see with, with this animal or this species that we don't see in other ones or whatever. I mean, there's, that's not necessarily too different, but it seems the platypus has a lot of these. I mean, these are some pretty cool things. That <laughs> and there's more. Yeah, I mean, yeah. I mean, there's there's other there. things you haven't even mentioned. Like, <laughs> how, what it, it it does seem. I know that there's been some at a certain points. People have said that, like, you know, the platypus is like you know, a crossroads of evolutionary periods or whatever, right? But and maybe that's too uncharitable. But there's so there's there really is. I don't. I can't think of another. I mean, there's some pretty you know amazing animals out there, but I can't think of another animal that is got a lot of those different features to it. And this is a hard. You know, people don't like these kind of questions. But why or why? <laughs> what could we say about why that is from an evolutionary perspective? How it can survive? How it can pass genes to a next generation? Why do we think it has all of these features? in one organism to 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 keep its survival there i really don't know the answer to that question <laughs> um it's one of the mysteries of life so they, they, we think that um electro or at least at least very recently some kind of australia's leading scientists uh tim flannery and chris helgen came up with a theory for why they detect electricity and that's that they evolved in um in like i said they evolved on the south pole where it's dark for three months of the year so being able to sense um food without light mm -hmm. uh, and the electroception allows you to do that is a really sensible evolutionary tactic yeah. but um the other one we didn't mention yet is venom so the males mm -hmm. produce venom but only during the breeding season so they are in fact the only uh, known seasonally venomous animal not just mammal there are very very few venomous mammals of any kind like a handful of shrews, slow lorises, salunodons, um, that's it, essentially, and platypuses. Mm -hmm. They're the only ones that do it and seasonally. And they, the males use it for a male male competition, uh, mm -hmm. fighting the females. Um, it is probable, or at least a theory, that the very first mammals were venomous. That these, they say, so the, the males have these uh, big uh, spurs, they're about an inch long on their ankles that connect to a venom gland. And on the outside, they're horny sheath. On the inside, they've got these little bones. And the very earliest mammals, which are tiny, you know, the size of a mouth, mm -hmm. um, they've found these bones, uh, these mm -hmm. ankle spur bones. Mm -hmm. And it, you can't tell whether there's a venom duct on them, but they had the spurs, we think. And mm -hmm. um, so it's possible that the platypuses have retained those things. And obviously, they've, re well, not obviously, uh, but they have retained eggs mm -hmm. from the earliest mammals. So the first mammals evolved from, from animals that look a lot like reptiles. And their, and their ancestors produced eggs and platypuses and echidnas have retained those eggs whilst placentals and marsupials have, have evolved a different system. Um, so a lot of those unique characteristics, you might say, are, um, are inherited from a long evolutionary history. That so has, these vestiges of time past of sorts. Yeah, they're vestiges, I think, is a loaded word because it, oh, it okay. means... Um, it means kind of something that's that's not very helpful. Ah, or, that's true. Yeah, uh, yeah. Um, but still, obviously, it using inherited, these, yeah. yeah, yeah, it's inherited. Yeah, that's better. Yeah, they're still obviously using it in their environment. That's how. Yeah, they're, absolutely. Yeah, yeah, they're yeah. you know they're super successful. Mm -hmm. um, echidnas are the most successful mammal in Australia. They cover every uh, habitat, every corner of Australia has echidnas. Platypuses cover pretty much the whole of the east coast and down into Tasmania. So they, they go from the wet tropics, mm -hmm. main forest, um, through, I mean, they, they need permanent water, but through uh, the temperate zone, um, and then, and and kind of, uh, you know, the subtropics and, and 
the whole southeast corner and then down into Tasmania where it's it freezes over winter mm. um, up in, mm. the, in the mountains in Tasmania it gets most it's overnight it's minus 10 degrees it's there last month and it's snow and wow the lakes are frozen wow not completely but um mm. yeah it's they're, they're very adaptable mm. Yeah, I mean, again, there, it's 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 so so interesting how all of these features that we see that are they're pretty amazing. I mean, they're pretty amazing to see it in, in one in one animal. One one thing you talk about in the book, uh, before we move on from the platypus, is is somewhat you talk a little bit about the history of the platypus, um, and I guess what is there this this ethic if we if we only see them in two places in the world, and there have been some. Uh, platypuses that have been placed in zoos, I, I believe that you, you you say in the book. Um, you know, it, it, is that kind of analogous to like, I don't know, taking certain animals from the Galapagos and putting them in a zoo or something like that, right? That's not, I mean, I think some people do that, but I mean, you mostly, wh wh how, do, how should we kind of navigate this, right? Like, should they just be preserved um, or, or maintained or, or have care for in their natural environments and not taken into uh, zoos or, or things like that? Or how, how, what's the kind of line here for trying to respect the animal um, especially in its in its uh, environment. I don't know that there's a difference between the ethics of keeping platypuses in captivity versus the ethics of keeping most other animals in activity. I think I, what I guess I'm saying is that if you're pro zoo, then <laughs> if you can keep a platypus alive, then that's fine. Uh, if you're not pro zoo, then then it's not. The, I mean, the particular challenge of platypuses is feeding them, um, <laughs> and that has been. The, that has been the the challenge for every attempt um, to keep a platypus in a zoo. So so far, America is the only country that has ever had platypuses alive. Mm. Uh, um, in uh, in the forties, in the fifties, in um, oh, there's one in 1920, and there's one right now. So you've got two in San Diego Zoo. Mm. Um, at the moment, uh, since mm. I think 2018 or so, or 2019, mm. um, and every other attempt. So there were attempts. Winston Churchill tried to get platypuses during the Second World War. Uh, he he requested six platypuses be sent to the UK, um, and they got four days away before um, a German U-boat came along and the ship dropped death charge uh, depth charges and the explosions killed the platypuses oh, no. in the ship. Mm. Um, so we've never had platypuses in the UK. But yeah, in terms of the ethics, the challenge is feeding them because as I say, they can eat up to eight hundred kilos of eight to eight hundred grams of um, eight hundred kilos of worms would be a lot. <laughs> they eat worms. They let, when the they were in zoos in the in the forties uh, and fifties in Australia. Um so Australia has a number of captive platypuses. Um there were there was entire industries around like around the zoos of people hunting earthworms and selling them to the zoo because they needed hundreds if not thousands a day mm. um, to keep them alive. So that's the challenge. But in terms of the ethics, I would say it's similar to most other species. They're very sensitive because of their extra sensory capability. Mm -hmm. Sure. Um, and they're nocturnal, which is well crepuscular at least. They, they prefer evening and um, mornings. Um, dawn and dusk. So that's the challenge for any captive animal that doesn't like to be out when people are in zoos. Mm. Um, but I don't think I don't know if the so the the humane Amer the humane society of Australia thinks that they shouldn't be allowed out for a long time. They weren't allowed out of Australia. Um, was well, in fact since 1921, Australia has had a ban on exporting them. And so every one of those instances that I've described um, was under license. But the ban was done not for their for their well-being but because the government decided it was um it was for tourism reasons if you could see platypuses in new york or london then people wouldn't come to australia to see them which i don't know if that makes a lot of sense like you know i don't think yeah. people go to zoos and say oh look there's a tiger now i had planned to go to india <laughs> right right um, yeah i'm not going to do that now <laughs> um, well, no, i don't know but it's yeah, yeah it's um I, I, yeah, that's yeah, it's, 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 I think it's a, I think it's always a, I guess, a tricky issue. I mean, I'm not really pro, I'm not really one way or the other necessarily. I'm not, I'm not really pro zoo though. I think that it's, I think we should take care of animals in the best way possible. Um, 
you know, as best we can in their natural habitat. Obviously, animals get injured or they need to some rehabilitation or something, which can be great. And there's plenty of reserves that try and do that. But yeah, keeping keeping animals in a cage just for people to come look at them uh, doesn't doesn't feel right. Doesn't feel good. Mm -hmm. Um, okay, so um, it's, it's the uh, echidna. Is that was how do you say it? Echidna, yeah. Echidna, yeah. Um, the, again, super amazing animal. Uh, you you talk about uh, many of the aspects of the echidna. So you talk about they have the spines. You talk about DEFCON one, DEFCON two. Uh, <laughs> you talk about their um, their snouts, the short beaked, long beaked. Um, just just tell us kind of about the echidna. Some people may not be familiar with with the the animal. So. Sure. So, uh, short-beaked echidnas, which are the much more well-known ones because they live, as I say, across the whole of Australia. They do live in parts of New Guinea as well, but short-beaked echidnas are, are by far the best known. They're about the size of a loaf of bread, and they are covered in these, these quite broad, um, but short, maybe two inches long, um, spines. Um, are they spines got, like, like porcupines or no? Yeah, they're hollow spines derived from hair. So they're they are like they are like a porcupine spine, uh -huh. um, but only a few centimeters or a couple of inches long. Uh -huh. so they're not, you know, they're not dragging them around like that. But they they were called New Holland porcupine or New Holland hedgehog. Okay. And, okay. Uh, by the first um, settlers, mm. um, and in fact, some of the first scientists described them in the same genus as porcupines. Mm -hmm. um, uh, and then they've got this long snout, which is. A, about five centimeters, two inches long, um, with a really long tongue and no teeth. With a long, sticky tongue, and that's because they eat ants and termites, particularly termites, um, and really, really strong front feet that can can smash into a termite mound, which are basically like cement in in northern Australia. Mm. Um, so they're really good diggers, but the it's the back feet that are particularly cool because they are backwards pointing, so they point. Backwards. <laughs> they're just really unusual. Mm. They've got these massive, long, curved claws, mm. two or three really long, curved claws on their feet. Um, and you mentioned DEFCON 1, DEFCON 2. If you if you startle an echidna, which is very easy to do, they're very jumpy, mm. um, they will go oh, DEFCON 2. It's <laughs> in the initial the initial fright, they'll just curl up in a ball. So they're, they're like a hedgehog, I guess. They've got this sheet of muscle under their skin they can contract and it pulls their head and their limbs inwards mm. um and their, their their spines down so that they meet they meet the ground so you'd have to you know if, if you wanted to flip them to get onto the the kind of exposed soft belly um to eat it if you were a predator um you'd have to get through this um spiny skirt particularly on their tails they've got like little penguin like tails but they're covered in spine mm. that's deck on two deck on one is if they're if they're really um scared and they're on ground that isn't like concrete um they do jazz hands with all four feet so it's like a kind of a handheld blender with their feet all four of them and they drill vertically downwards into the soil and they just disappear uh, uh below the soil just leaving this this mat of spines at ground level it's incredible they do it in a few seconds it's like with a little shimmy and they're sunk into solid ground um and and then in the ground they'll stick their feet into pebbles and roots and things and you it is completely impossible to pick them up um, you just can't like a predator could not get them and so we don't think they form a significant part of any animal's diet in australia um, although i have i have found um tasmanian devil poo with echidna spines in it but i suspect they were scavenged rather than mm -hmm. um uh, hunted mm -hmm. it the, I mean, of course, I mean, there's, there's a few things that will stand out for a reader, um, whether that's a good thing or a bad thing, I don't know, but, um, they have some interesting mating routines and it is quite different, uh, that they have four, a four headed penis. And so this is, um, <laughs> I remember reading this in the book. I'm like, I have never heard of this. What is going on? Like, you know, so, so you just describe, I guess, how they mate and, and how does uh, a four headed penis, you know, actually work? I mean, how does, I mean, again, I'm anthropomorphizing here, right? So, I, yeah. so you know, it's like, how, how does that, how does that work? How does that work? You know, there's, a, there's an old joke, or at least in the UK, there's an old joke about hedgehogs and how do hedgehogs mate and they, and they ask them very carefully. <laughs> yes. Is, uh, true sure. for, for echidnas, but it was a real mystery for a long time, which was literally only solved a few years ago. Because um, when 
So uh, echidnas and platypuses have a cloaca, so they have a, it's kind of a one-stop shop for all of their mm-hmm. um, reproduction, waste disposal, uh, egg-laying needs. Mm-hmm. So it's one hole. The cloaca is one hole. It's, it's Latin for sewer. Um, and, and the males keep their penis inside their cloaca, so it, it's, it pops out. This is not visible mm-hmm. uh, most of the time. It pops out when they need it. Um, but it was a real uh, challenge for uh, biologists of the echidna to work out how they reproduce because you can you can stimulate an animal to get an erection with a little mini taser. Mm-hmm. Uh, every time someone did this to an echidna, this seven centimeter long big penis would pop out, which is significantly bigger than the female reproductive tract. Mm-hmm. So how they worked was was a real mystery. And and as you said, they've got these four heads. So it's a long, like I say, seven centimeters long. But in the end of this um pole is like four little anemone heads. They look, mm-hmm. they've got these rings of of um papillae, but I guess they look like tentacles, mm-hmm. um, arranged in a kind of in quarters and quadrants. Um and you look at it and you think that that looks like like I don't know, like the head of a, a worm in a worm monster in Star Wars or something. <laughs> and and um, it was only when when there was this particular echidna who was donated to a research group because every time he was handled, he was at a zoo. Every time he was handled, um, he got an erection. And it's only mm. this particular uh, echidna they worked out what actually happens when you're not tasering echidna's penises. And that is that only half of the the penis is used at a time, so left or right. Um, so that that's that's how they that's how they. So they stumbled count. on this. Yeah, yeah someone <laughs> stumbled on this. But um, what they do to to and there was this early account. Well, it wasn't that early. It was from the nineteen twenties of how a kidney is made. Um, that was described as they kind of rear up face to face. Um, and uh, you know they're belly to belly, but standing on their back legs. Now that is de- that was described as the same nineteen twenties, and it's definitely not what happens. Mm. Um, in the, what they do is the males will follow the females around in a what we call them echidna train. So you've got the female at the front, and you've got a bunch of, of males um, following behind her, waiting for her to become receptive. And being a spiny mammal, uh, she can protect herself against male suitors mm. um, until she is ready, uh, and then they'll fight. And um, what happens is that the female will lie still, and the male, when the male will can dig a little uh, divot underneath her back end and sit himself down in that divot, and kind of just go over her back, uh, you know, put his, his body over her back, um, and that's how they mate. Uh, the, there is a, a kind of for, to our human sensibilities, there's a much less uh, pleasant story, and that's that echidnas in colder parts of Australia hibernate. Um, like Tasmania and, and and parts of Victoria, um, and what the males do there is that they wake up from hibernation a few weeks before the females, um, and kind of feed themselves up, and then sniff out a female that's hibernating and mate with her while she's still in torpor, um, mm-hmm. which is yeah, like I say, dry human sensibilities doesn't sound great, does it? Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Um, but then you know, three weeks yeah, later. It, it reminds me. It reminds me a little bit of. Um, I talked to uh, um, um, uh, um, ornithologist on here. His name is escaping me at the moment. And he wrote this book called The Evolution of Beauty, I believe. Um, Prom. Prom's the last name. And um, he talks about, there's a chapter in there that's very fascinating. There's, there's more to it than, than just the kind of, you know, uh, activity. But how ducks uh, will copulate. Um, mm. and that's also got some things to make humans uneasy. There's some, mm. there's some, definitely some forced kinds of, uh, at least in our minds of, uh, uh forced kinds of, uh, copulation. Um, but it's, yeah, there's, there's some really interesting things, but then also you know, he describes in detail, which was really fascinating about how females can reject these advances and how they will uh, attempt to to you know defend themselves and it's, it's very fascinating again it, do, do we know with, with um how they 
why the four heads? I mean, no, is it, I is, 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 I, well, actually, I've got a theory about the because there's one. There's like one shaft, and then it's got four heads at the, right. at the end. Right, yeah. and, and I, why they alternate, I don't quite know. Um, but I think these papillae, these little tentacle things. Mm-hmm. My mm-hmm. guess, and it is a guess, is that it's to do with sperm competition. So, mm. um, sperm competition is evolves in arises in in animal systems where the mate, the female mates with multiple males. Mm. Um, and she can, uh, the, well, the kind of thing that you talked about where the female can reject mm-hmm. sperm uh, is, is, you know, that, that is something that a male might uh, try and evolve some sperm competition adaptations. But one big thing that often happens is that they, the males produce a, a huge amount of sperm when the females are um, mating with multiple males. Mm. Uh, and, the, and it's just an odds game, just by volume. So like chimpanzees have made with multiple males, they have massive testes and produce a massive amount of sperm compared to gorillas where they're more monogamous um, and they've got tiny testes and produce very little sperm. In echidnas, they've got massive testes, they produce a huge amount of sperm and the sperm swim in bundles. So I, I describe it a bit like a cycling peloton. So that, they, that they helps the males have kind of uh, slipstream their mm-hmm. sperm, um, but that wasn't your question. Your question was about the penis. So the uh, it's related though. I wonder if those little tentacles and perhaps the general shape of the of the echidna with the penis with these foreheads is a is a means by which to scrape out the previous male's sperm. Mm-hmm. Um, and that's actually one theory for the shape of the male of the human penis of why it's got a head on the end. It might um, help. Interesting. Previous. Hmm. Hmm. It's, it's, it's very fascinating. It's, it's again well, when we see the just the realities of how reproduction happens all the time in 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 with many organisms on the planet. Um, you know, it's it can be interesting when you you kind of read it in a book and it's like, oh yeah, you know, how do other people or excuse me, how do other animals uh, do this? And you know, we have all these you know norms and taboos and all these things, and and it's very interesting how how it just happens all the time in the world and with different organisms. And um, you know, many people don't think too much about it, but it's it's, it's very fascinating. So you, know, uh, you asked, you asked me about long beaked echidnas. Which, uh, oh yes, I did. Yes, they, like there, so there are there are three other species of echidna at the moment, um, other than the short beaked, and they all live in New Guinea. Um, so there's yeah, they're all long beaked echidnas. So they are much bigger than a short beaked echidna, and they have this long curved um, uh, snout bill. Um, that is the the whole animal is like they can reach a meter long. They're huge. Mm. Uh, beasts um really mostly earthworms yeah. they and they are currently as far as we know confined to new guinea although a specimen was found in a museum a few years ago that was collected at the turn of the 20th century so in in the kimberley mm. um, so it's possible they're still out there in the kimberley mm. every time i'm out there I'm looking for them intently <laughs> yeah it's, i was gonna say the short beaked are only found in Australia, as far as you know. No, they're, they're found in, in New Guinea too. Oh, okay, in both. So only the long only beaked ones. Australia, uh-huh. as far as we know, only has short beaked echidnas, uh-huh. and then the others, the uh-huh. within. Um, that has to be. That has to be like a, a super, uh, super fun when someone finds something or says, "Oh, maybe there was one here or something." That has to be such a such a fun discovery when 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 that ha- when that occurs. Absolutely, there is yeah. and there's fossil evidence of long beaked echidnas in yeah. Australia. And there's rock art. Um, of long beaked echidnas, but just mm. nothing in, in the last few thousand years mm. um, until this one specimen. Mm. Um, so let's let's move to marsupials. So there's a it's another big class of animals um, uh, down under, <laughs> um, and not just down under, but uh, many many are, are there. Uh, there's kangaroos don't live anywhere else. Uh, and it depends what you mean. So there's about seventy species of hopping marsupial in the in the kangaroo family. That's a lot. Kangaroos, <laughs> wallabies, palamelons, um, dorcopsis wallabies, tree kangaroos. Uh, Rock wallabies, um, here I'm missing some <laughs> forest wallabies, uh, betongs, potteroos, uh, musky rat kangaroos. So the 70, so they many. live in Australia, New Guinea and surrounding areas. Um, okay. but they don't live anywhere else other than that. But kangaroos, which are just three species of common name kangaroo, mm-hmm. eastern grey, western grey, red kangaroo, they only live in Australia. 
Mm-hmm. Yeah, that's very, very helpful. Well, I was going to ask if you could describe marsupials generally, you know, what, what makes them stand out or what are the things about them, their features that are, are, you know, unique or different or, or, or otherwise, what is it uh, about marsupials? Um, again, they're mammals, uh, they're in a class uh, of mammals, but, uh, what is it about them that is, uh, uh, distinct? Yeah. Like I said, at the start, it's, it's about how they reproduce. So they produce, they give birth after incredibly short pregnancy. So the shortest pregnancy of any mammal is 10 days, the bandicoot or a honey possum, um, and a honey possum, should I say, 10 or 11 days. Um, so that is short, you know, less than two yeah. weeks. <laughs> and then. Do they, they live a long time? Uh, they live relatively long, yeah. Um, oh, wow. Uh, but then they do most of their infant growth sucking milk on a teeth. So mm. if you take a placental mammal and a marsupial and you say, when is it weaned? Um, so when does it stop suckling uh, mm. after birth, after conception, should I say, from conception to weaning, uh, for, a, for an equally sized animal, placentals and, and marsupials are the same, but marsupials do most of that growth suckling, whereas placenta lose most of that growth in the womb. Mm. Um, so that's what is kind of most obvious about them. There are some, there are some relatively uninteresting skeletal differences, which uh, they're just like where, where different holes are. Mm-hmm. That's not that. That's not. Well, well, there was, there was one that maybe this is what you're referencing that, but there's, is it that uh, marsupials have two uh, uh, vaginas and they're different from placental mammals in this, in this regard. And then they have the pouch. Maybe just chat about this yeah, as yeah. well. So most marsupials have two vaginas, and it's not as weird as it sounds, um, no. because if you think of the human reproduction system or, or any placental mammal reproduction system, if you start at the top with, with the ovaries, you've got a pair of ovaries, mm-hmm. you've got a pair of fallopian tubes, mm-hmm. and then they join one uterus. Mm-hmm. And then from the uterus is obviously only, only one vagina mm-hmm. and one cervix. Um, and in marsupials, and most marsupials, they've got same so you start at the top you've got the two ovaries and two fallopian tubes but there's only uh, but each side continues to only have one uh um, uterus so they've got the each, each ovary has its own womb and then from that womb ha- is a separate vagina what is interesting though um, so it's, it's one womb yeah then they've got two wombs oh, there's two wombs sorry uh-huh. so yeah the whole thing is pet rather than in in placental mammals and humans including humans um Ovaries and fallopian tubes are paired. So there's one on each side, and they meet in the middle at a shared uterus. Mm-hmm. In marsupials, it's it's paired all the way down. Uh-huh, uh-huh. Um, what is interesting, though, is that in kangaroos, at least, and probably some others, um, when they give birth, so they've got their two they've got the two lateral uteruses, yeah. two side uteruses, which is how the sperm get in. Um, but when they give birth, they actually produce a third central vagina from where the two uteri meet um, and that's how they give birth and in some species that then fuses up until the next time they give birth um and in some species once they give birth for the first time they produce this vagina and that's there for the rest of their life so uh, marsupials can have three vaginas is it is it something where they can have uh uh um I can call it a fetus. Uh, uh, yeah, yeah. Well, yeah. Uh, yeah. Any animal, that's, any baby that's still inside the body. So you have, a, can you have two in each at the same time? Can, yeah, you can have loads. So, huh. for example, Tasmanian. This is a like this is one of the most amazing things I think in natural history. Um, well, there's so many things about marsupial reproduction are amazing, um, but what they do. So uh, a a um, kangaroo. Sorry, a Tasmanian devil gives birth to about 20 um, babies, or a qual even, which is a spotty relative of Tasmanian devils, give birth to 30. And these things, in the devil's case, so a big female devil is about eight kilos. I don't know what that is in pounds. Um, <laughs> maybe 20. I, I can't do the conversion in my head that quick. What <laughs> um, uh, size of a uh, uh, um, bulldog, I guess? Mm-hmm. The terrier. Mm-hmm. Um, so they give birth to 20 of these things that weigh 0.4 of a gram. So they weigh nothing, you know, like the whole thing is like the whole litter is like a, you know, a couple of sachets of sugar. So in very um, callous terms, when they give birth, that, that litter of babies is energetically not very costly to the mother. Mm-hmm. Um, so she hasn't you know, grown a whole baby, a massive baby. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Um, 
So at this point, they're playing the odds game, uh, a bit like frog spawn or fish spawn, where they produce a huge amount of babies and they just hope that some of them will make it. So mm -hmm. as many devils and quolls and some other marsupials start their system off like that, like the frogs playing the odds game, they produce a load of, of babies because the challenge is, and this is genuinely one of the most amazing things about, about marsupials and all marsupials, well, pretty much all marsupials do this, it's that the babies have to climb from the vagina to the pouch uh, on their own after days in the womb. So the embryo has been born, you know, the baby has been born, like I said, potentially up to 10 days. Um, in a kangaroo, it's five weeks, um, so not very much. Um, and they've got the muscle power and arm strength and nervous control to climb unaided from, uh, from the birth canal to the pouch and hand over hand they're like they look like jelly beans with arms and lips um and then in the womb in the sorry in the pouch on the teeth they'll attach themselves uh permanently with these massive lips and they'll just stay there suck, suckling so that's what well, pretty much every marsupial does except bandicoots um but in tasmanian devils they're playing this odds game um because that's a really hard journey so kangaroos only give birth to one baby at a time and they just hope that they make it uh devils to a shorter pregnancy um after three weeks they give birth to these 20 babies that then uh, try and climb into the pouch but there's only four teeth and because marsupials attach the teeth uninterrupted unlike pigs or dogs they can't share teeth so you can't raise more babies than you have teeth so devils have four teeth um so only for a maximum of four babies um uh, will make it so it's they start off with the, what I'm describing as this frog system of numbers based game, but then they go into the kind of, if you like, the human system, um, or the bird system of producing a very small number of young and then investing heavily in them. So they go from one system to the high investment where they, then they then invest heavily in these up to four babies. And that power, that climb to the pouch must be difficult because we very regularly, so I do a lot of field work in Australia. I haven't said that. Um, particularly with Tasmanian devils. And um, you very regularly find devils which have got fewer than four babies in their pouch. So obviously, even though they've given birth to 20, not all of them have made it. Um, but the ones that are in the pouch, then they're getting this fat-rich, protein-rich milk pumped into them. And they grow really quickly. I, I wish I wish the listeners could see my face at the moment. This is <laughs> absolutely incredible. I mean, I have a million and one questions, which I won't ask you about. But I mean, that's... I, I mean, I, I mean, what can you say to that? I mean, it, it, that's, 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 it's, it's a, such a marvel of, I mean, look, I mean, you know, human, uh, uh reproduction and, and, and how, how, um, you know, ch childbearing you know, happens is spectacular. But when you look at other animals in the, in, on the planet, it, it's incredible. I mean, that's, that's incredible to me about how all of that i mean climbing just after you're out of the birth canal to just get to a power i mean that i mean that's yeah that's that's one of those things it's a mind-blown it moment it's amazing and i just want to say that when this is described in textbooks or um <laughs> museum labels the word that is used is that marsupials give birth to underdeveloped young uh -huh. and again this is a subconscious accidental colonial framing or at least a marsupial inferiority placental superiority framing that to say they're underdeveloped what they mean is they are less developed they have grown less than placental mammal would but they're not underdeveloped they have not failed to develop um they're exactly as developed as they should be uh, but it's just that they do it differently and because it's different it doesn't mean it's worse yes. in fact in australia where the climate is unpredictable there's droughts there's floods there's fires if you've got this system where you've given birth to a tiny, tiny thing mm -hmm. without having invested much in it. In the early stages of pouch growth, if the mother's life is put at risk by environmental conditions, it's very easy for her to abandon that baby. You can mm -hmm. reach in and, and take it out. And that sounds emotionally callous again, but yeah. you know, we're humans, they're not. Um, that is what they do. And so, you know, there's a lot of, um, mothers who will abandon their babies in order to save themselves um and that is way easier to do if you're a marsupial mm. it, i want to talk to you about the possums you, you say opossums is the same right no, no? so no it's not opossums, okay. okay opossums are although it's so opossums are what live in the americas 
possums are what live in Australia. Possums in Australia are named after opossums in the Americas. But obviously, <laughs> Americans do abbreviate opossum and just say so, so they're really called opossums because I've always known them as pot and most people that I talk to around here, they just call them possums. Yeah, they're opposums. That's it. They are quintet. different. It's not like they're it's just a weird. Okay, okay. All right. They're so like, what, like what's the difference? Tens of millions of years different. <laughs> oh my goodness. So, well, I mean, they look different. <laughs> like, you know, all of, so pretty much every marsupial, almost every marsupial in the Americas, 100 species are a kind of opossum. You have really? short opossums, you have woolly opossums, you have four-eyed opossums, you have the big opossums, the large American opossums, so like the Virginia opossum, yes. the southern opossum, yes. and this uh, further south in Mexico, um, and the mouse opossums. Uh, so they are all most closely related to each other. So okay, um, yeah. there's, a, there's a complex story here, which I will mention, but okay. there, there's, so there's about 100 species of, Australia, of American marsupial. Okay. Um, and they're all closely related to each other. That's, they're all most closely related to each other. Yeah. Uh, more closely related to each other than they are to the Australian ones, except for one. The Monita del Monte uh, is more closely related to the Australian marsupials. And what we think happened is that, like I described, marsupials described uh, evolved in the northern hemisphere, crossed into South America, crossed into Antarctica, uh, and then into Australia, and then one went back. And that's the uh, <laughs> the ancestors of the Monito del Monte. So some of them stayed there. That's the, the opossums. But those were basically 100 species of opossum, um, tens of millions of years uh, different from the Australian possums, which are most closely related to kangaroos and wombats and koalas. So so, so they are related. They're just they're both marsupials. So they're yeah, more yeah. closely related to each other than they are to us. Or right, right. Elephants. Uh huh. But there, um, there, there is many years do. between them, yeah. though. Many years, between, tens of millions of years. Well, either way, I, I had again. A, I had no idea that. I mean, this is my ignorance. I had no idea that opossums were a marsupials, and and then the whole idea that like there's a pouch and like again, right? Like it's. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, I was, I mean, I, I shared this with some, some people. I, I told my wife this, and she goes, "No, I, that doesn't <laughs> doesn't it's compute." Really interesting. There's that, two yeah. things, two things to say about that, and that is one <laughs> that there is a, it's a myth. Like people think, call Australia the land of marsupials, right? Yeah. Only half of Australia's mammals are marsupials. The yeah. other half are placentals, mm -hmm. a quarter of bats, quarter of rodents. So. We ignore all of the, that that fact that only half of them are marsupials, and and we ignore and like so many people think that Austra that Australia that marsupials are, are uniquely Australian. Uh -huh, it's, yeah, it's just not the case. About a third of them live elsewhere. Um, but I, and I want I think it's interesting that they are not famous animals. I think that the world has decided not to care about American marsupials. Well, I mean, this is just me speculating I, I don't i don't know i wonder if it's because they're they appear right they appear from a distance or whatever i mean they're, they're quite large in some ways i mean but they appear similar to rodents um you know they have the long tail um you know they have the 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 hands and maybe the 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 what is it the snout or the nose um I, I i mean obviously they're not but i could see that maybe some people have certain feelings about you know certain types of animals and something in that you know yeah. and like and like you and know like people think like about pets. koalas or kangaroos <laughs> they see them as more aesthetically uh, appealing I, I, that's my guess that's my guess i i yeah, don't necessarily true. feel that way but <laughs> it's true that virginia opossums which is the, the common species in north america um are not very pretty let's say that um, but also because they like hang out in people's gardens, they are yes. kind of a bit well, or roofs, you know, or and they kind of literally raid trash cans. They yes. yeah, they're kind of denigrated into the trash animal bin. I but it, it is, I think, it is just an aesthetic thing because raccoons do the same thing, and people love raccoons. <laughs> I mean, they don't like them getting into their trash cans and, you know, messing with their house pets or whatever, but they, you know, this, they got the whole, like they're bandits and you know, what, <laughs> whatever the things the cartoonish things we say about them and, you know, they're, you know, playful. And I mean, you know, there's, they, there's a certain, I think a lot of this stuff, unfortunately comes down to aesthetics. I mean, which mm -hmm. is, you know, I think, I think that is a real thing. I mean, that's a real thing. Yeah. Uh, um, and it's a shame because a lot of the South American and Central American marsupials are way cuter 
Um, mm-hmm. been, which are um, which are the ones down there? So that would be shrew opossums, mouse opossums, water opossums. Oh, still, opo- opossums. still opossums. Still opossums. Uh-huh. They're, they're, they, they look different yeah. though. They look cute. They're they're less uh-huh. ratty. Yeah, yeah. So I mean, again, there's so. I guess what makes the opossums here in North America, you know, similar to maybe some of the the ones around the world, but also what makes them different. So they have a pouch. Sometimes they they uh, the 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 young climb on their back. Is that right? Then the, the pouch yeah, yeah. on the back. Like there's some things that are unique about them. Some things are. Well, I guess what is the, the the characteristics of of them a little bit? Um, of American marsupials, but right. opossums. Well, yeah, yeah. they like they. Hey, they're pretty generic mammals, I would say. Mm-hmm. They don't, they are, yeah, mostly arboreal, tree living mammals. Mm-hmm. And they're omnivorous. So they, there's nothing particularly remarkable about them, but they were, they were first encountered by Europeans, um, by, oh, what's his name? <laughs> Pinos? Is that his name? It was, he was one of the captains that sailed with Columbus and then he crossed back over uh-huh. to South America and came across an opossum, mm. um, and took it back to, Queen Isabella and um, King Ferdinand of Spain, and mm-hmm. uh, it was alive. And she stuck her Queen Isabella stuck her hand in the pouch. So it's like it was from this first encounter. Uh, they, they described it as a monster. Pinyons, I'm pretty sure. Mm-hmm. I'm pretty sure that's his name. Um, described it as this, this monstrous thing that has a, a bag, a sack beneath its belly. So they, the pouchiness of them was just was known straight away. But they, yeah, there's not a great deal. Of, remarkable about them i would say i think that, to be the, fair, i also know much less about them. <laughs> well it's just it is a i think if it's uh it's it's a it's a it's a i think a surprising fact for most people that they are you know marsupials mm-hmm. and they they live here in north america uh there's there's a few i just want to give like real quick just a kind of overview i mean just to kind of give us the the, the whirlwind tour you mentioned many different marsupials which you know you, you people should read the book and, and read about it you talk about i'm going to say this wrong d- dasarids as a group that's the urids that's yeah. urids okay you talk about p- Paturus? Is that how you say it? Paturus. Uh-huh. And batong, <laughs> batongs? I'm terrible at this. <laughs> batongs, yeah. Batongs. So, <laughs> so, so you talk about many different types of marsupials. Uh, so maybe just kind of give us the kind of general overview of some of the differences with some of these animals that that sure. uh, that are that you discuss. And then we can talk about um, the thylacine. Okay, cool. So yeah, the, the famous marsupials are obviously like kangaroos and koalas and perhaps wombats. I think the best. Um, but there's that's only like a tiny slice. As I said, there's about 70 in that hopping marsupial uh family, and um, the macropods we call them. The kangaroos are the, are the most famous, but there's a bunch of other wallaby-like things, including that, that they also they hop. They will hop. Um uh-huh. there's there's kind of there's tree kangaroos, which are kangaroo kangaroo relatives, hopping marsupials that live in trees, and they've got um really long tails and they're, they're probably the most beautiful marsupials. There's rock wallabies which um jump along cliffs and so they kind of fill the mountain goat niche if you like um and they all have pouches and, correct all of the micropods have pouches yes mm-hmm. all the hopping marsupials have pouches mm-hmm. um but then the dazzurids you mentioned so that's a similarly sized group so about a quarter of marsupials or so maybe even more are dazzurids and they are the carnivorous marsupials mm-hmm. so tasmanian devils are definitely the most famous and probably the only mo- the only famous dazzurid so they are the biggest um the male grow up to 13 kilos again i can't do pounds female to about eight um so like pitbull sized scavenging bone crushing strongest jaws of any living mammal mm. is a tasmanian devil mm. um the moment well now that they're, they're confined to uh, tasmania which is on state south of mainland australia mm-hmm. um and um but they used to live on the mainland until about three thousand years ago or so we think when dingoes arrived um, and then the rest of the other urids are much smaller, uh, but they go down the next ones in size of the quolls, which I mentioned earlier. So they're the spotted, uh, beautiful, um, the biggest ones are cat sized, the smallest ones are ferret sized. There's six species of them, four in Australia, two in New Guinea, and they're, they're predatory. Um, so they will scavenge too, but they'll eat small mammals and lizards and birds and uh, whatever they can get their hands on. And then like there's, as I said, there's about 70 of them and they've got, um, you know, they're, they're relatively unknown by most people, including Australians. But Antichinuses, Panagales, Coltals, Fascagales, Colutas, Kawaris, Dibblers. <laughs> There's a bunch, but they they generally fill um, 
they're in, they're they're either insectivores or um, kind of small vertebrate predators. Mm. They are predatory, and they are the most vicious animals I have ever worked with. So the smaller really? they get, the more they're likely to try and take your face off. But the smallest wow. are the planigales, and they're only two grams, so they can literally stand on a on a blade of grass. Um, mm. And they will really go for you, but obviously their teeth are less than a millimeter long, so they they can't do anything about it. If, you know, devils, by contrast, you know, famous because of Looney Tunes for being super right. aggressive. Right. They're really aggressive to each other, um, but uh, they are like the floppiest animals when you handle them. But because of that bite force, bone crushing situation, we don't take any risk. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Um, but that's the, yeah, they're, these are, they, there's the areas are found across the whole of Australia, different ones in different parts of Australia, depending on the habitat. Um, and they are kind of mouse sized up to squirrel sized. Mm. Um, and they are the main predators in Australia, mm. of the Desert Euros. Mm. Um, and then everybody knows ka- koalas, I guess. One bat to the uh, kind of burrowing 20, 30 kilo sized. And uh, they're the biggest burrowers in Australia. Um, uh, who are we missing? Some marsupial moles. Mm. So they are tiny, well, mole sized marsupials <laughs> that do the same thing that mm. moles do in uh, the northern hemisphere. Um, but they are marsupials. So they've got massive forelimbs, great diggers. They kind of swim through the sand. Um, silky fur to keep that, fur, uh, keep the sand out and um, reduced eyes. Uh, numbats are the anteaters of the marsupial world they're little squirrel sized stripy things um and you asked about potteroos and betongs mm-hmm. so they are um small cat sized if you like uh, hopping marsupials um some of them are omnivorous or at least eat tubers and fungi and they 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 kind of dig little pits to find that food and um, they might take insects as well um and one of them, I've worked a lot with one species of betong called a burrowing betong or a booty in Western Australia. Um, and they are the only burrowing hopping marsupials. And they used to cover the whole of pretty much the whole of central and southern Australia, at least in the arid zone. Um, and now they are restricted, well, they became restricted after European invasion just to the islands um, in Shark Bay, uh, unfortunately. And if you go to those islands, it's amazing because they are everywhere like i've been on an island that's been cleared of predators and cleared of, mm. the reason being mainly due to native cats and foxes that their numbers have, have declined sorry introduced did i say feral cats i did say feral cats, feral cats and foxes that the europeans brought with them um if you go to the islands without them they are everywhere like i've been one of four people on an island with ten thousand endangered mm. booties um and they they dig these massive social warren systems they're really fighty so they're kind of they're kind of feeding happily alongside each other and then suddenly they'll drop to their flanks and kick out the little booty kicks so they're super cute and um, i like them they've been introduced in, to some mainland reserves uh mm. since where there are no predators uh, in fenced reserve but yeah they're the, the smaller potteries and betons the smaller hopping on super is is it um it seems that there's a lot of there's a lot of obviously large uh, marsupials but there's also very small ones is you're talking about very small ones is in terms of the evolutionary history i mean we know that mammals sort of came on the scene somewhere in the triassic and actually did live with dinosaurs but they were super small and you know they kind of towards the end there and then they've they've evolved you know over time do uh, how i guess in terms of the evolutionary tree how old are some of these animals at least their um you know their ancestors and how long that they've been living um there's many advantages to 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 being small there's disadvantages too but i mean for marsupials uh, and marsupials on in australia how how long have they been around in terms of you know periods well, marsupials, by definition, are exactly the same age as placental mammals because mm-hmm. they're each other's closest relatives. So that's split. So marsupials and placentals um, have a shared common ancestor that lived about 160 million years ago. Mm-hmm. So the, that is where the path that led to us separated from the path that led to koalas, uh, if you like. Um, and then in that time, these just like in placental mammals, they've diverged into you know primates, rodents, bats, etc. Um, marsupials have split into the diprotodontids, which are kangaroos, koalas, possums, uh, wombats, mm-hmm. the desert urids, which you talked about, marsupial moles, numbats, and the um, American marsupials. Mm-hmm. Um, 
So they are they are distant cousins for us. <laughs> yeah, right. all, all like all life on Earth is related. Well, well of course, yes, but but the marsupials yeah. are are distant relatives for us. Are, we are more closely related to marsupials than we are to platypuses, and then to mm-hmm. crocodiles. Mm-hmm. Right, right. <laughs> Well, I mean, in that in that way, there have been many extinct animals as well. And there's endangered animals as there uh, as well. You don't have to go into the, I mean, unless it's relevant, the definitions of what makes someone, you know, endangered. What's the what's the category? It's endangered. Uh, there's all these categories or whatever. But um, there's been many extinct animals. You can just chat about that. Uh, I guess broadly, if you, if you want, maybe some of the animals that have that in, in Australia that have gone extinct. But obviously the the biggest one, uh, or excuse me, I should say the most, I guess I'm going to say famous, I guess it's just, it gets a lot of press, um, is the thylacine. Um, so I, I know that we had some engagements online about this. Uh, there's, a, there's been a bunch of uh, pieces about this of trying to genetically revive or resurrect the thylacine and it sounds like there's the capability to do it. Um, I think you had some, some threads online and then you also, I think wrote a piece on it recently, which was very good. Um, so yeah, maybe just kind of broadly talk about extinct animals in Australia and then the thylacine specifically. Sure. So I guess in, in chronological order, um, in recent time, in geologically recent times, Australia used to have way more animals than it does now. Um, and like other parts of the world, um, it suffered from ice age extinctions. So the ice age megafauna. So in, you know, in North America and, and Eurasia, um, we lost the um, mammoths. In uh, also in the Americas, there's the giant sloths and giant armadillos and uh, giant deer in in Europe and Asia. Um, and yeah, there's big beasts. And Australia had a very similar story uh, in that it had. The biggest ever marsupial was called Diprotodon, and that's a, a wombat relative that was, was the size of a rhino. So a wombat today is, you can say, about 30 kilos, so the size of a small sheep, if you like. A, a short-legged sheep, but <laughs> <in> density. <laughs> um, uh, but now, uh, 50,000 years ago, the Diprotodons were about 50, uh, uh, were about two and a half tons, so the size of a rhino. Um, and there were also other giant marsupials that get known as the marsupial sloth, the marsupial tapir, marsupial lion. So the marsupial lion is super interesting because it's kind of a leopard, 100 kilo, 220 pounds, I can do that one. (laughs) Um, (laughs) Predator, it's described as the most uh, specialist predator ever to have evolved, the most predatory predator, if you like, um, ever to evolve. We've got these massive retracting claws thumb spikes, uh, huge front teeth because it's related to wombats. It's got these massive and almost rodent-like teeth, but they're super sharp. And then really long blade-like teeth on its jaw, a lot like a tiger or a lion. Um, and so they, they, all of these giants died out, or most of these giants died out about 50,000 years ago, um, which is when uh, humans, or shortly after humans first arrived in Australia at 60,000 years ago. Um, so there's... <laughs> elsewhere in the world as soon as humans arrived like 13,000 years ago the mammoths go in, in north america and then the giant sloths 12,000 years ago 10,000 years ago further right south same story in um, australia um but then I mean, we could talk for a long time about the, the australian megafauna but unfortunately since european invasion in 1788 um Australia has lost more mammals than anywhere else in the world. So it's the Austra- it's the, mm. the mammal extinction capital of the world. So 30-something species have gone extinct in Australia in the last 250 years, which is 37% of all mammals have gone extinct in the world. Because uh, of humans? Because of Europeans, um, <laughs> in, in, to be specific. Um, Very specific there. <laughs> So this isn't because of environment or or climate or because of I mean those are also in factors as well but you know be, due to European influence in a negative way that this thirty seven percent has gone extinct. So one one species, the bramble case melamese, which is a rodent um, that lived on a an island in the Great Barrier Reef, went extinct. Is the is the first animal confirmed extinct due to human induced climate change. Um, so that isn't specifically Europeans in Australia killing that one off, but it is <laughs> humans generally have killed off the bramble case melamies due to rising sea levels on a lone island. Mm-hmm. But the rest, um, mostly 
the threats are, or at least broadly, I should say, the threats that have killed off all of those animals are um, habitat loss, uh, particularly habitat loss and um, change fire management practices. So the change from Aboriginal management to what well, originally no management to what happens now um, is a big threat. And that is also linked to climate, obviously, but, but worse um, and bigger fires are spreading. And, and also another massive threat is, as I mentioned earlier, introduced animals. So cats and foxes were brought to Australia. Well, cats were brought initially um, as pets and partially as pest control. Um, foxes were introduced um, outrageously for just for hunting. So the only reasons that Europeans took foxes to Australia was uh, to chase them around on horseback. Um, and those animals have killed well, have completely changed Australia. So they've driven 30 animals to extinction, or at least been complicit in those, their extinctions. And then most other species, or let's say many other species, have been re re you know, driven down to tiny fractions of their former range. And on top of that, there's been introduced rabbits, hares, camels, buffalo, deer, squirrels, rats and mice, house mice and brown rats, black rats, Pacific rats, um, pigs, goats. I'm sure I'm missing some, but all of these things that have fundamentally changed Australia um, and competed with them for food, eaten them, killed them, poisoned them, in the case of cane toads. Um, so it's, Australia is a pretty bad place to be if you're an Australian mammal, which is unfortunate because, as you said at the start, it's the only place that most of them live. Yeah, it's their home. I mean, it's 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 yeah. home for them. So, yeah, I mean, it's very upsetting. I mean, it's it's very, it's very, very, very upsetting. Um you know, I mean, they live with it now and, and have for, you know, a couple hundred years, but I mean, it is, it is very, very upsetting. Um, so talk, talk to us about the, the thylacines. Just tell us what, what this animal was. Um, uh, when was the last known thylacine? Although there's some, mm -hmm. there's some, some, some sightings, apparently, if you go on the internet and you know, someone spotted this, you know, in this, in this mountain, you know, some blurred image or something. Um, and then, yeah, I didn't talk about the, you know, how it went extinct and then, and then, uh, um, this crazy Jurassic Park kind of, you know, let's resurrect the thylacine with genetic kind of modifications or whatever. Sure. So to look at a thylacine, you'd think you'd be looking at a member of the dog family, um, but with stripes. So they they evolved. Um, yeah, they're they're ambush predators. We think um, they were very much dog shaped and dog sized, um, but they had these twelve or sixteen black stripes on their bodies they were kind of buff brown um color and they had these thick base tapering tails um but they look uh, they looked incredibly wolf-like dog-like whatever mm -hmm. um and they at the time of you they again like tasmanian devils they used to live on main, mainland australia until three thousand or so years ago we think when dingoes arrived um but when europeans arrived they were only found on and indeed for the last three thousand years or so they were only found in Tasmania. Um, and Tasmania was, was settled by Europeans in 1803 the first time. And they attempted, the Europeans attempted, or well, successfully uh, established a sheep farming industry. Uh, that was one of the main ways that, reasons that, that Tasmania was settled. Um, and um, the thylacines were blamed for killing sheep, mm. which we now know was almost certainly not what was happening. So the Europeans, with their sheep farming, uh, whilst that was trying to get established, and it took a while to get established, they were hunting kangaroos um, to feed themselves, Europeans, which put them in great conflict with Tasmanian Aboriginal people. Um, but also, it meant they bred kangaroo dogs, um, which they bred for hunting kangaroos, the Europeans. Um, and those dogs went feral, and that is almost certainly what was killing the sheep rather than the thylacines, but the farming lobby blamed the thylacines. And so by 1830, uh, bounties were put on thylacines' heads, and they were extinct uh, not much longer after that. So the last, you asked when the last known one died, the last known animal was the most famous extinct animal on the planet, I'm sure, um, is was a thylacine 
that was videoed and photographed. In fact, a number of individuals are videoed and photographed mm-hmm. at a zoo in in Hobart, Tasmania. Um, so those last nine known animal died in 1936. That is certainly not when they went extinct. Um, that the, the as you say, there's so many sightings. I, uh, I looked it up just last week for something I was writing. Things like a thousand and twelve, but don't quote me that. More than a thousand sightings since 1936 of a thylacine. Some of them are certainly true. Um, there are, you know, people. You know, you never catch the last animal alive. You know, well, I suppose it's statistically possible, but extraordinarily unlikely to catch and uh, to see the last member of the species, especially right. on a state with so much um, uninhabited land as Tasmania. Um, so I, I I would, until two years ago, I would have said thylacines certainly hung on until the 60s or 70s. There's the most famous sighting is in 1982, which is no reason to disbelieve. And so I'd say, you know, that's fine. There was a, but two, what happened two years ago is that um, a scientist at the University of Tasmania called Barry Brook and his team uh, did this really clever mathematical model on all of those sightings. So they created a database of every sighting actually since about 1900. So including before um, the last known animal died. And they assigned a score to how likely it was that it was accurate. So like how many people saw it? What was their experience? Like were they a trapper that had been catching thylacines before 1936 and therefore had a really good experience of them? Knew what they looked like and therefore their, their sightings in the 40s are likely to be true? Or is it, you know, an animal just spins into a bush as you're driving down the road. Um, you've seen for less than a second. And in fact, <laughs> I was on the ca- train to Cambridge last week in, in England, and I saw out the corner of my eye an animal running across a field that looked more like a thylacine than <laughs> anything else. I mean, it, it, it must have been a dog, but it, it looked more like a thylacine than anything else. So I'm very sympathetic to people who, mm-hmm. I know I think about thylacines a lot, so I've got some mental suggestion going on there. <laughs> I see right. an animal. But yeah, I understand why people see them. Right. Um, but anyway, Barry's Brook, Barry Brook's model came out saying that the most likely extinction date was the 1990s to early 2000s, which is amazing. Like to think that thylacines were probably alive during my lifetime is pretty stunning. Um, but they are these icons of extinction because they're effectively one of the only deliberate extinctions in recent times. It's an extinct, a large predatory animal. It was the only member of its family. So they are related to Dasyurids and also numbats, but not very closely related, um, like 40 million years of split. Um, so they're the only, they're, when they died, like the whole branch of the tree of life fell off. Mm. Um, so there's a huge amount of guilt uh, involved there. And that's probably a lot of the psychology behind why so many people think they see them. I, I am not one of the people that believe that st- they're still out there. I, you know, many people do. Mm-hmm. Um, and it, it's obviously not impossible, but um, I don't think so. Uh, there's too many cameras in Tasmania. And there's too many cars for someone not to either photograph one or run one over. Mm-hmm. Um, uh, but there's this story that broke last month of, of um, a, a group of scientists at the University of Melbourne have been given a lot of money, initially five million, but now it's at least double that. Um, and a, in partnership with a biotech company in the US called Colossal um, to de-extinct the thylacine. Now, the scientists involved are extremely reputable, you know, at the greatest of intentions. And and to be fair, they know a huge amount more about genetic engineering than I do. Mm-hmm. But I just don't think it's possible. I think what they're suggesting can be done is to take you don't you don't think said, it's you don't think it's possible or you don't think it's morally I think correct? it is impossible and morally wrong so okay I okay i, I okay. don't think they will succeed but i also don't think they should try so so yeah so on both accounts why is it impossible and then why is it morally wrong so again i'm not i'm not an expert in genetic engineering but what i do know is we suggest it's not real it's not possible because what they're saying they're doing is basically saying okay we've got the genome we know what the, the genome of a thylacine looks like there's 800 museum specimens they've taken genetics and they've, they've come up with a pretty good idea of what the genome is um the first problem is not complete so they don't know what the whole genome is it's like 90 95 percent and that's just yeah that, that's that's a big gap um the second problem is that what they're saying is they will compare that 
genome to a Dunnart. So a Dunnart is a mouse-sized Daziurid, a mouse-sized carnivorous marsupial. It's literally the length of your finger. And they will compare the genome to of a thylacine, which weighed 17 kilos, a small thylacine weighed 17 kilos, a big one, 20 kilos, 23 kilos. And they will compare the genome um, to a Dunnart, and then they will edit the Dunnart's genome. They will change the genes that are different to make them thylacine. Now, that is done. That, that technology exists to change a couple of genes, or like a couple of base pairs, in fact. But changing the entire, like the, the different, the gap between Dunnart's and thylacines is 40 million years. So that is, I, I, that is huge. I, I'm trying to think of what an, an animal that I know is 40 million years split, but I can't, but it's a lot, you know? Well, it's, but it, 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 again, it legitimately is the Jurassic Park problem because that's yeah. what they did. They had dinosaurs, they had part of the, from the mosquito or whatever, yeah. and yeah, then yeah. they had to fill in the gaps with frog DNA or whatever it was. <laughs> You're, well, you don't have that animal. You just have a, you've created an and, animal. And this is where the ethics comes in. First, I mean, firstly, obviously genetics has come a long way since Jurassic Park. Was of course. Yeah, sure. Um, and the the ability to edit genes does exist um mm -hmm. but not on that scale and maybe one day it will be but I, I don't know but the problem is yeah the ethics of what they're actually what they've quoted they are quoted as saying we won't get a thylacine we'll get a thylacine ish thing and that's like that's a problem i think you of know? course so, i mean and there's there, there's so many problems scientifically with trying to do it in the uh, what, it's the same company that want to clone mammoths from um oh, yes from yes. Uh, elef asian elephants uh, and the ethics of doing that are extraordinary because and it's it's utterly clear cut in this case because to what you have to do is create a fetus of a mammoth but it's not a mammoth it's a, a hairy asian elephant mm -hmm. and then implant it into an asian elephant and then it will have a 23 month pregnancy or an endangered animal forced to have a 23 month pregnancy to give birth to an animal that was larger than it um like a sentient animal as well you know a very highly intelligent social animal like the ethics of that are terrible mm -hmm. when it comes to thylacine at least mammoths and, and elephants are a similar size when it comes to thylacine you know donuts <laughs> like i said tiny thylacines are pretty big and they said oh you know firstly um it doesn't matter because marsupials give birth to tiny young but like a thylacine baby would have been a significant proportion of the entire Danart size. Mm -hmm. um, and they said, okay, so either we'll, we'll implant it in, in another animal or we'll create an artificial womb, which has never been done. And they're saying, well, that, you know, that problem is smaller than the how to do the genetics part of it. So let's not worry about that. Baby. And now, undoubtedly, down this road, there will be genetic developments that could help other conservation methods that are genuinely useful. For, for other parts of conservation biology. Mm -hmm. um, but in the end, I do not believe they'll end up with a thylacine. Or I don't believe they'll end up with a thylacine-ish thing. Um, but aiming towards some kind of Frankenstein animal mm -hmm. is a problem. And the and, and I I've said, like putting tens of millions of pounds, this is the biggest cash injection there has ever been into a Australian conservation effort, according to the team involved. And that is appalling that's not on them that, that no no it's not on them but it's disrespectful for the fact that we have animals that are still living and endangered that could use that money absolutely. for many other important things absolutely and, and people the people on the other side say you know that it's not a zero-sum game that that money would never have gone to australian conservation it doesn't I don't matter know that that's true but it yeah. Doesn't, yeah, it money. doesn't matter i mean you're <laughs> i mean look if if we could do it a hundred percent sure <laughs> In a, in a sense, it would be it would be spectacular, and 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 it would be great to have a thylacine around again. But I still think, even if we had a hundred percent or ninety nine point nine percent certainty, we could do it. I still think the ethics of it and the morals of it are questionable. Yeah, the the other aspect of it is the message, especially in the. Uh -huh. I mean, especially if you're certain it's not going to work. But um, as if, if one is certain it's not going to work, um, but the method, the message that this is the poster child of overhunting. Like we deliberately hunted this animal to extinction. Mm -hmm. The bounty system killed thousands of them. Mm -hmm. So did habitat loss. Mm 
um, the bounty system mainly. There may be some other factors, but we hunted this animal to extinction. And if we are putting out the message that overhunting can be solved by, it doesn't matter if tigers go extinct or orangutans go extinct or rhinos go extinct, we can just bring them back. Mm -hmm. I think like extinction is forever. It's a very powerful notion. Like yes. we can't, if we, if we miss this, if we, if we let the last rhinos die, that's it. Um, and suggesting that it's not the end of the story. It's well, yeah, it's, 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 it's people that have watched too many movies where, you know, no, no, no character actually dies. They just come back in some way in an alternative universe or something like we can't actually do that in real life. And further, you know, when, when you have animals, uh, like rhinos or tigers or things like that, you know, it's one thing that, you know, animals go extinct for various natural reasons, right? And they have in, in times past, but I think where there is a predator like ourselves, humans, on other animals um, for sports or for a game or, you know, whatever it may be, you know, we have to live with that. Mm -hmm. We have to live with that. We can't just say, whoops, you know, well, we'll just bring them back. And, you know, that's, that's, that's not, uh, I mean, there, there isn't, an, there's enough moral and ethical, um, uh, difficulties there that is for me at least uh definitely you know i'm i'm totally fine with having the conversation with people that you know want to say well let's think about it like that's fine i guess to have the conversation but before you get to the actual steps of you know start <clears throat> you know kind of actually doing it uh we should probably go much 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 slower um in, in actually trying to do that if at all so i want to ask you uh three final questions here uh, the first question is, is you, you talk about it in the book that there are many um, indigenous people groups in Australia um, and there has been a pretty tough history with, like you were saying, you know, colonialism and things like that in Australia. But it sounds like folks down there, you know, in, in indigenous tribes and groups and peoples, they have they knew or they have their own um uh, taxonomies or their own ideas or their own histories their own um ways of understanding these animals and so it seems like much of that history has been washed out i mean how do we how, how do folks that um you know have been living there for many 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 thousands of years how do how do we collaborate with with those types of folks and 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 work together and, and learn from them about various animals that, that live there as, as scientists yeah well i think i mean the first thing to be said is that it's some of our outrageous things uh, happen i mean so many outrageous things happened in terms of dispossession and and murder and mm -hmm. genocide in, in tasmania's yeah. case um but what i was going to say is that the the knowledge the indigenous knowledge um that could have been uh collaborated with uh along the way as it was like people People attempted it in the history, in the history of uh, Australian mammals' uh, relationship with the West. There were some really big questions that people wanted an answer to, and things like "Can some mammals lay eggs?" was one of the biggest questions in the history of uh, 19th century science, because it had so many implications for whether evolution was true for one thing, but also just how we fundamentally understand mm -hmm. how the world is arranged. And obviously, Aboriginal people have been living with platypuses and echidnas for 60,000 years or more. So why it took us 90 years to prove that Plashpus is playing when people were asking at the turn of the 19th, turn of the 18th century, asking indigenous people, how do they reproduce? And of course, indigenous people said they lay eggs, but mm -hmm. those people were ignored or mm -hmm. dismissed mm -hmm. um, by the European scientific elite who were in Europe, not in Australia, like, Australian based uh, European naturalists are also saying they're laying, but it was only when uh, they saw it with their own eyes, uh, effectively, they believed it. Um, and soon after, uh, European settlement, settlement such an inadequate word. It's not, settlement sounds like, you know, gentle settling slopes. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. No, obviously that's not what happened. And people were militarily dispossessed of their land. Um, but anyway, after European settlement, uh, people were, were driven off country in ways that the opportunity to learn about 
what animals live there was went pretty quickly um, in a lot of cases. But now, uh, obviously, a lot of scientists is, are utterly, a lot of ecologists uh, are utterly um, aware and, and very active in collaborating with uh, traditional owners and indigenous groups into how, ma- how land should be managed. Um, you know, when it comes to fire, I mentioned earlier, so Australia has a long history of fire, particularly because of Aboriginal burning practices. Um, that when when Europeans arrived, they described seeing like parklands. Now, this is an amazing book called the, uh, "The Biggest Estate on Earth" by Bill Gamage, and another one by Bruce Pascoe called um, "Dark Emu," which describes like the uh, what can be garnered from archaeology and early European accounts of just the extent to which Australia was a managed uh, ecosystem um, where people would be burning uh, over like cycles of generations to accurately um, time their burnings to create certain habitats. Um, that knowledge is being tapped back into to, to try and avoid the kind of bushfires that Australia is now suffering due to climate change. But also it's not just due to climate change, it's because land has been allowed to um, build up huge amounts of fuel, mm-hmm. particularly in Northern Australia. Um, and now organizations like Australian Wildlife Conservancy are working with, uh, traditional owners to, to create a more traditional set of, um, burning practices to avoid the fuel build, building up. So there's those mosaic patches so that the fire can't actually run for that long. Um, and, and elsewhere, you know, all over Australia, um, ecologists are working with, with, um, local indigenous groups to ensure that they have a say in, in how the land is managed and, and that everyone's involved in those discussions. So, so there has been a shift in absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. Well, that's, I mean, I'm sure that it could go far further and sure. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's, it's unfortunate when, um, you know, we see that all around the world, you know, definitely here in North America, it's in central and South America. Um, it's in, you know, it's all over the world, it's in all the continent of Africa and, and uh, various uh, Asian countries as well. It's, it's very frustrating. Um, you kind of touched on it there uh, about the impact of climate change. I mean, obviously, people will remember the, uh, the fires in, um, in 19, 2020. I was gonna say 2020 of January, right? Yeah. yeah, it was like November to February. Yeah, February yeah that, that was, I mean, it was something, oh man, I saw absolutely, I mean, it brought me to tears seeing these heartbreaking videos of koalas. Being, oh, this is terrible. This is terrible. Absolutely terrible. And, um, you know, something, what was it? One, one, it was in the millions of animals. Billion, I had, billions uh, of animals died. I, it, um, all lost their homes. It started off with like half a billion, uh, was the estimate. And then it was a billion vertebrates. This is, mm. um, and then it's, it's billions of animals died, lost their homes. Um, so sad. Yeah. And like, you can't, when, when animals populations have already been diminished by all of the other factors I mentioned, like mm-hmm. they, it's, it's going to increase the extinction risk, um, mm. a lot for some species. Is, is, is there, is there things that, um, certain groups or the government of Australia or, or certain scientists are doing to try and, you know, coordinate and try and care for endangered, uh, species or, or, you know, obviously, you know, climate change is a big problem for, for the planet, obviously as a whole. And, and Australia in particular has had some distinct uh, challenges, but, uh, is, is there, you know, work being done to try and prevent well, that as much as, as possible? There is a bunch of amazing ecologists, conservation biologists in Australia doing really hopeful work, um, particularly uh, with habitat regeneration and controlling invasive species. Um, that is very hopeful, and you know, who knows? Uh, I, maybe further extinctions will be prevented. Um, a point I make in the book is that all of this idea that we started talking about that Australian animals are lesser somehow weird and wonderful, strange, all these inferences that they're inferior, that they're biologically less well adapted is really unhelpful when you're trying to value something. When you're trying to say this is value, valuable that when, when politicians or landowners or, or anyone in a decision-making position is weighing up the economic interests of big agriculture or mineral extraction or fuel extraction um 
or industry of any kind against a possum um, or a wombat or a rock rat. Um, if those animals are assumed to be biologically inferior and therefore it's almost like their fault that they're going extinct. Mm. It's much, much harder, I think. It's much, much less likely that the decision will go the right way. Mm. Say, okay, we're going to protect this. I think just the idea that they're weird is belittling. Mm. Um, so I think all those things are, are tied together in how we think about them. And it's, and it, as we have talked about, it's the mammal extinction capital of the world. And it can't have helped that they've been looked upon as these weird little evolutionary oddities in the end of the world, isolated and doomed to fail once mm -hmm. a superior group of animals has arrived. That's not what's happened. Um, well, this goes directly to my last question, which is, you know, what is, I don't say necessarily the best, but what's a, what's an improved or more accurate way of understanding and respecting animals from Australia and uh, kind of uh, connect it with that is what do you hope uh readers of your book they walk away with where you can say that's exactly what i was what i was aiming for you you got the message of the book and uh so yeah kind of uh, those those two uh combined questions well i hope it's not too difficult because as we started with like people are really fond of australian animals like they are obviously brilliant but what i would like to happen <laughs> is that we drop this weird and wonderful trope and we just stick with wonderful we just but the but the narrative isn't it's instantly oh how strange it's not it's you know not nature's weirdest uh invention um it's that oh my goodness this is one of the most incredibly adapted animals on earth or or you know 300 of the most incredibly adapted animals on earth it's just that so much more value is put into how we talk about australian animals and like that that it's the narrative is just generally more celebratory and absolutely you know people with decision making uh ability in australia to put more money into conservation and, and i think the new government is that's a lot more hopeful than it has been but successive governments have failed to successfully well not even successfully have failed to try to um to conserve uh their habitats and everything that ecologists are doing in australia is against the backdrop of so far insufficient federal support it wouldn't cost very much money to, to you know, fix people have cost it up mm -hmm. it's not very much how much yeah, it, it makes it. yeah it's it's i from, the book is, is is basically a celebration of these things and just for these animals and just describing how we how we came to describe them in the west um mm. so that's that's what i want to get across but they're amazing Yes, yes, absolutely. I fully agree with you. The book is called Platypus Matters, The Extraordinary Story of Australian Mammals. Um, is it, uh, I'm not uh, clear on the, it's released everywhere now, right? In the UK and the US. Yeah, yeah. And yeah. Australia and yeah, it's, it's, okay. it's all over. Where so, so, so people can can find it in those places, and uh, where can people find you and your in your work and and all the all the particular spots? So I'm yeah, Jack Ashby. I guess the easiest way to find me is on Twitter, Jack D Ashby. Um, yeah. Yeah. Well, look, I, it's been absolutely uh, marvelous to to talk with you again. As I said in the beginning, um, I I really was interested in the book. I learned a terrible amount, so many things. It was a great read, very easy, and it was it was one of the best books I have I've read this year um, for sure in, in this genre and, and how we how we understand animals and the planet. And so it's uh, I can't recommend it highly enough. Um, so thanks for coming on and, and talking about it for for a good two hours. Uh, I can't uh, couldn't have asked for anything more. So so big thanks. Thank you. Thanks for having me. It's been great. Okay. Thank you.